Welcome to Friday Afternoon at the Manor. My name is John Joseph Mastandrea, and it's, uh, again, we have another wonderful lineup for today. I have a hearing about, uh, from our wonderful Reverend, Reverend Dr. Sherry Genova, but Susan will be introducing her very shortly. And again, just reminding everyone, you can come in person or tune in online. And uh, over to you, Susan. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for coming. Today, uh, we are gifted to have uh, Reverend Dr. Sherry DeNovo, who spent 10 years as an NDP member of provincial parliament and has written a book about what it is like to be gay on the streets of Toronto in the late 60s, early 70s. So we are definitely willing to hear that. Doctor? Thank you. Um, and it was fitting, uh, Susan, that you had uh, sirens in the background, <laughs> that introduction uh, to uh, living on the streets. Um, I thought what I would, I would do is I'd start off uh, just with a bit of a reading from the book. And uh, this was excerpted in Now magazine in Toronto and um, has been heard in, in other venues. But uh, it's a way to get a get feel for uh, certainly the beginning of my career as a kid. Um, so this is from a chapter two, it's called, the head of the heading of the chapter is The Revolution. Kids, kids, everywhere, the cops on horseback had broken up the anti-Vietnam war rally. I remember a lawyer saying, get their badge numbers, to no avail. And the demonstrators streamed into the downtown core. The anarchists, mostly kids, started smashing store windows. The Maoists, kids too, were waving the red book and shouting running dogs of U.S. imperialism. This completely astounded Saturday shoppers who thought the Maoists were referring to the kids running up the street. That's when someone started yelling, it's the revolution. Instead, and perhaps regrettably, it was just a bunch of us socialist, hippie, peacenik, anarchist street kids. We were a tiny minority at the time in a vast capitalist state, it was in Toronto. I was a cynic. The Vietnam War was an abomination, no doubt, but the kids I hung out with in the street drug trade never believed for a moment the adult world would change. Not really. We all wanted to be William Burroughs or Jimi Hendrix or Janis Joplin. We assumed we would die young. It was far more romantic and more likely than revolution. I'd left home at 15, believing myself to be more mature than the neurotic, violence-prone adults at home. In that, I was at least somewhat correct. There wasn't a name for what afflicted me back then, but it's pretty safe to say I suffered at the very least from PTSD. The other children I met on the street were much the same. For most of us, it was safer on the streets, couch surfing, sleeping rough, or piling into a rented room somewhere than going home. Occasionally I'd sneak back home, but it was never worth it. I didn't need my mother harassing me about where I'd been. I'd been everywhere. I fed myself by selling LSD at the time under the Food and Drug Act and not criminalized. That was imported from California in hollowed out Bibles. Yes, I get the irony. The product was so pure and strong that it would pay $5 each for tablets in quantity and then divide them into four and charge $10 for each quarter. And a quarter would keep you stoned for 24 hours. Despite the excellent profit margin, we never had any money. We were kids and we were also stoners. Try counting money while stoned on acid. We lived on toasted danishes and coffee. Booze was declassé, and besides, we were way underage. We got stoned almost every day on something. And someone was always trying to tune a guitar. We listened to music constantly, rock, jazz, experimental, and we read voraciously. Our topics went from revolution to jazz to cinema, and in memory, we were all brilliant. Certainly, we were precocious and arrogant. Now I look back with nothing but love for those teenagers who knew everything. I'm skipping along a little bit here. Meanwhile, the hallucinations of LSD became tiresome and softer drugs no longer sufficed. A new drug hit our streets, made and sold by our local bike gang. It was methadrine and it changed my life. I realized it was everything I liked about LSD without any of the negatives no troubling, crazy moments. Methadrine was just the euphoria and the ability to go without sleep or food. It was cheaper than cocaine and more direct. Like a poster child for a slogan about gateway drugs, I moved from acid to meth. It did take some effort. For starters, I had to buy it from the bike gang. That meant walking a gauntlet in a coffee shop diner filled with bikers. Imagine a teenager who looked about 12 walking past a collection of psychopaths just so she could score. 
I wasn't going to laugh at them. I wasn't insane. As I said, it took some doing, but I didn't do it for money. I never sold it. Too risky. I just wanted to use. I'd like to say it was grace, but one day on Bloor Street, outside the Swiss Chalet near Bedford Road, I passed out. I hit the pavement. I came to before an ambulance could be called and before too many people gathered. I managed to get myself a chicken sandwich, the best I'd ever had, which was when I realized I hadn't eaten or slept in days. That moment I discovered something in myself that has saved me a few times since. I didn't want to die. I moved back to Centennial Community College with its high school equivalency program helped by psychiatrists, clergy, anybody that would help me. It was geared exactly for kids just like me. I dropped out after grade 10. The college was populated with kids serving time, kids out on day parole, kids from institutions, and kids like me coming off the streets. Our professors were products of similar stories or they would have had good university jobs. One was a refugee from the Gulag, another a defrocked priest. They were some of the best teachers I've ever had. We kids were all motivated by the same small voice that reminded us we wanted to live. Hindsight suffuses that entire experience with light and grace. Somehow in spite of everything, teachers and students alike were free. Freedom is grace always. We with grace had survived. This year was a holy year. We left the college as apostles of survival, mentored by other survivors, knowing it was possible. We learned to love our damaged, effed up selves. It was entirely conceivable for many for the first time that we might live. Um, I'll stop there. Uh, the book goes into my political life as always too, uh, but that I, I would say is the first time that I was aware of the Holy Spirit working in my life. Um, in politics, I, I tell that story too. And I, and the byline of the book is a socialist clergy's radically honest tale. So uh, I'm, it's very unpartisan. It tells the truth about what it was like to be in my party. And also because I knew others, uh, it's small town in politics uh, and the truth it is to be in every political party. But despite it, uh, we accomplished a great deal. And I just wanted to kind of go over some of that before I uh, tell you another story that I think is a story of hope as well. Uh, so in 1971, I was the only woman who was part of a demonstration, the first quote unquote gay demonstration on Parliament Hill called We Demand. And truly it was a group of uh, hippies who had what we believed were utopian demands at that time. Things like equal marriage, being able to keep your children if you came out, uh, not uh, having to be fired from your job when they found out that you were queer or 2SLGBTQ, uh, and things like that. And um, I look back now, you know, <laughs> Um, some 50 years later and say that we won every single one of our demands. And in fact, there were demands that we could have, should have made around trans rights that we have also won. Um, so in 2001, I was in pastoral ministry at a church in Toronto's West End and two uh, women of color came and asked if I would marry them. Uh, I did so because equal marriage was not legal at that time by reading out the bans, which just on the on the bans form had two, just bride and groom. It didn't say male or female. So we performed the marriage, married uh, pa Paula and Blanca were their first names and uh, sent it in um, with a little prayer to the Registrar General's office. And by the grace of God, I like to say, uh, the clerk in the Registrar's office vetted it and thinking that Paula, P-A-U-L-A, -A, was a man's name. Well, then, of course, uh, you know, everything broke loose. Um, it, it was reported in the Star, Paula and Blanca, with a picture of their marriage license. Um, the government of Ontario threatened to take away my license. I'm sad to say the United Church did not come to defend me. A lawyer did, Doug Elliott, who was very active on the issue at the day, in the day. And, um, uh, and the CBC went to bat for this. So uh, within a year, luckily, before anything could be done about my license, before I could lose my job, uh, the Supreme Court of Ontario at that time vetted it and uh, made de facto uh, same-sex marriage legel. And so the marriage that I had done and Pell and Blank is held, which was 
great good news. Um, because of that and the publicity around it, I believe, uh, that's why uh, my local NDP came and asked me if I would consider running. I hadn't been politically involved, obviously. I'd been very socially justice activist, considered myself a, a, a socialist, um, was very active around equal marriage, et cetera, but I had never thought about running for political office. Uh, they asked, it took me about three months to decide. Uh, I remember a couple of quotes from people in my congregation when I asked them, to discern whether I should run or not with me. One uh, came from a, a leader in, in social services in our community, Victor Hayes, who said, uh, you know, Sherry, I wouldn't wish that job on my worst enemy, but I think you should go for it. <laughs> so that was one piece of advice. The other piece of advice um, was from a gentleman who wasn't an NDP, he was a liberal. And he said, you know, when a political party comes to ask you to run for them, it's kind of like being asked to the high school prom by the quarterback. It's very flattering, but then you have to spend the evening with a football player, which I also thought was hilarious. Both, by the way, happen to be true. Um, <laughs> and I discovered that by uh, spending, um, yeah, 11 years, almost 12 years actually in politics, in political office. Um, needless to say, when I ran, um, I was very naive and very green. And uh, the campaign run against me for which in the foreword of this book by Kathleen Wynne, our former premier, um, she apologized, which was very gracious of her, um, really attacked me for exactly the sort of activity I was involved in as a street kid, for being drug involved and street involved um, at 15, 16, and 17. And, um, uh, and it backfired, thank goodness. Um, I'd never hidden that. Uh, in fact, I preached about it. We had a service of mainly street involved and folk with mental health or addiction issues in our evening on Sunday evenings at our church. And, um, and I preached my story to them as a story of hope. So um, I did win and went on to continue winning for another three elections after that one. Um, one of the first bills that I tabled was the bill to make trans rights human rights and named that bill after our music director, Toby Dancer. Uh, Toby was trans and Toby died of an overdose, which is not and was not unusual. About 50% of trans folk even today attempt suicide. About 50% live under the poverty line. So it was one of the, one of the um, bills that I knew I wanted to table. And of course you never do anything alone. Um, I did it in company with a number of uh, incredible trans activists who I talk about also in the book. Um, it took uh, from 2006 to 2012, tabling it multiple times, trying desperately to get support from uh, mainly the government, of course, because I was in a third party with no power, you know, sitting as a backbencher, um, and also from conservatives. So ultimately the bill passed when I got a conservative and a liberal to sign on to it. Uh, and that was the first in North America to add the words gender identity and gender expression, trans rights, in other words, to the Ontario Human Rights Code. Many years later, the federal government followed suit, and so did many provinces and other jurisdictions as well since then. Um, in 2000 and, um, that, so that passed in 2012. In 2015, as I was traveling around the province with a committee that was supporting gay and straight alliances in high schools and getting feedback from folk. Um, we had a group of psychiatrists that came and testified before the committee who said that we shouldn't be doing this, uh, that, it, that you know, being uh, queer was not normal nor natural uh, and that their entire practice was based on turning uh, to us LGBTQ kids straight. In other words, conversion therapy. Um, I, and we were in fact all shocked by that, um, which I'm happy to say, everybody on the committee. Uh, and then we kept hearing tales that it was not only them, but it was happening in other places. Uh, it was happening in fact, in one of our largest institutions uh, that was one back then of the only entry points for trans folk hoping to begin their transition, usually as teenagers. Um, and uh, so a group in Sudbury that I met with called TG Inner Cells that were a trans group said that this was their major issue and this was something that needed to happen. So unlike um, Toby's act that took me six years and a whole lot of work and a whole lot of tabling, I managed to get this done in two weeks 
from second reading to law just before Pride. It shows you how things can change from 2006 to 2015. Uh, and again, we were the first jurisdiction in all of North America to do that. That was a jurisdiction of any size at all. Uh, and he, in fact, President Obama even gave a shout out about the bill and said that this should be uh, enacted in every single state in their union. Um, and now, as you may be aware, the federal government is proposing to bring it in. Now, what's the difference, people ask? Um, and Terry represents almost half of the population of Canada. So uh, it was major that has been banned here, but we can't criminalize it. Only the federal government can make conversion therapy criminal. So it's very important that they do that, we think, um, because this doesn't just target those people who are billing on OHIP or psychologists or psychiatrists or MSWs. This would then target even faith groups who are engaged in it, which is difficult to, you know, difficult to go after and to control. Um, so we're hoping that this session of, of parliament, it finally gets done. I was there when the bill was introduced. Um, very happy to support it and uh, hope that it gets done in the next few years. Um, and the last bill, the very last bill I tabled um, was in 2017 before I left and went back to ministry. I decided I didn't want to run again. Uh, and that was a Trans Day of Remembrance, which calls upon everyone who in question period, which is when most of the politicians are in the house, to observe a moment of silence on November 20th. That date is coming up. And other than during COVID, when no public was allowed in, I have gone back. And even with a conservative government, everyone stands up and observes a moment of silence. Why? Because I use my tried and tested method of getting a conservative and a liberal. So it was a tri-party bill to sign on to that bill. That's how we finally got it done as quickly as we did before that year's pride. Um, there are many other bills I passed. In fact, I passed more uh, private members bills into law than anyone in, Canadian, in Ontario's history, possibly in Canada's, I don't know about that, but certainly in Ontario's. And again, it was working across the aisle. I mean, faith teaches us this, you know, uh, to love your enemy, to work with your enemy, much as I disagree with just about everything um, our conservative government does and say so very vociferously on social media. Um, uh, you know, you need to work together to get laws passed. And so I did. Um, uh, and there's always, uh, there's always, you know, some spark and someone, you can find a champion in the strangest places. So I just did a series actually that I think was recorded as well for the United Church Learning Online, which you can access about, uh, the title was How to Be a Christian Activist, um, which I felt very strongly about. In fact, um, uh, every single bill that I've ever passed had a face behind it. And it wasn't someone famous. It was someone often very reticent to come forward who simply felt passionately about an issue or had an issue in many cases, most cases that affected them directly and thought that something should be done about it. And so we in my office and I just went to bat for them and made sure that we fought for you know, what we could get done didn't get everything done that I wanted to get done, even with what I accomplished in, in those years. And I'm very honored to have been able to do that. Um, but um, we did get a lot done and prove that you can, prove that you can, um, first of all, with no power, um, get to your political representatives and get them to be your champion. And second of all, we proved that with no power in parliaments, you can get a phenomenal amount done if you work across the aisle. And so I preach that message as often as I can and in many places as I can to as many people as I can, because I think it's critically important. We somehow feel that we don't have power and yet we have all the power in the world as people who elect our representatives. Um, so I usually say, start with your representative wherever you are, um, work with them, become their friend, um, have them know you and have them associate issues with you. Be at the mic in all candidates meetings. Don't stop when they get elected. Uh, go visit them wherever they are, whether it's Parliament Hill or Queen's Park, if you can make it. Um, and make sure they know that you're still there. I said on the United Online series, I said, we have over 2,000 churches in the United Church of Canada, coast to coast to coast. Imagine if just two people from each of those churches went, for example, on the issue of guaranteed livable income 
which the United Church has decided to support. Imagine if just two went to their MPs, either virtually or in person, um, and said, you know, I'm here representing my church, and we really want to see this become law in this parliament. Um, we had in that series, Leah Gazan, who tabled the bill last time, tabling it again this session, and um, we're hoping that we can really see that bill come to fruition. The majority of Canadians support it. We know this by polling. And, um, but just imagine the lobby effort and the lobby impact of two people from each congregation making it their mission to see that this happens. Um, and I can tell you that local people want to know who you are because you are the ones who either hire them or fire them. I always remind elected politicians of this, which I've done after the last election often, that even if they feel like they don't have any power within their party or within their government, um, that in fact, that party, no one can fire them except you. You are the only people that can fire them. They're in a job where they cannot be fired. Now, could they conceivably be kicked out of caucus? It's the last possible thing any political party wants to do. And I'll tell you why the truth, they lose lots of money for every elected person that they kick out of caucus. So, um, so to hold, to know their power, your elected officials, to, to be able to say, listen, you have power, whether you sit in cabinet or not, you have enormous power, use it. You just need to stand on principles and not on partisanship to be able to do that. And that's something I think that we as Christians uh, should really rally behind and really support. Um, and certainly we proved in my tenure there, tenure there that uh, it does work. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll uh, you know, begin to wrap up with a, another story that's from the book and from my life. Um, and it's a, a story of hope. Uh, I said last uh, Thanksgiving Sunday that They've proven now, some, some university <laughs> or other, that, um, that you know when you're asked, would you want bad news first or the good news, that the ones who say, give me the bad news first and the good news second are the most hopeful people who get the most done. So we started with kind of the bad news of me being on the streets. And I wanna end uh, with a bit of good news um, as well. I mean, I think my entire story is good news, but a bit of good news from someone that I knew and loved who was on the street. Her name was Bernice, she's since deceased. Um, and Bernice was one of the folk that used to come to our evening supper. We built our evening service on Sunday nights around those, as I said, who um, had mental health and addiction issues and lived rough or lived on the street and they needed to eat. <laughs> so we built it around a supper, we had a service. Uh, first we just did the supper, but then they said, well, why don't we have a service too? So we started the service as well. In my first book, Queering Evangelism, which is gonna be re-released soon, um, I speak about that experience. So Bernice was one of those people. And Bernice at the time was at least in her 60s, if not her 70s. And she was what used to be called in less politically correct time, a shopping bag lady. And she pushed a shopping cart with all her worldly possessions in it. She slept in bus shelters. Sometimes she got shelter in some places, but you know, not always. Um, and she would sit, so she didn't get showers often, and she would sit off by herself in the corner. And I thought it was because, you know, she felt inadequate and didn't feel, you know, right sitting with other people, you know, that maybe she hadn't washed enough, you know. Um, and so being the do-gooder, um, I went over and sat down with her and I said, Bernice, you know, we're, there's a bunch of us sitting at this other table, why don't you come and join us? And she looked at me like I was completely, you know, beyond, around the bend, and she said, Sherry, do you see the young men sitting at that table? I said, yes. And she said, well, if I join them, she said, I will drive them wild with lust, <laughs> which I thought was great. Um, you know, uh, what about confidence? That was amazing. Um, it, certainly that, that in itself <laughs> showed me that, you know, we really don't understand other people's desire, sexuality, uh, who they are. You know, we think we know, we don't know. Anyway, the ending of that story is that, guess what? Bernice did come over and join us at that table. And skipping ahead a few months, one of the young men at the table is 24 years younger than she was at the time, asked her to marry him, and we married them. So she was right. She was right. Um, so I performed what was and still will probably always be the most joyous wedding I've ever done. 
It was done in our evening service. It didn't cost a dime. The food was provided by uh, Daily Harvest and, uh, and Daily Bread. Um, uh, and uh, this clothes were provided by, uh, I think, the Salvation Army or Value Village. Um, and that's how they got married. Uh, and we had a celebration in their honor. So um, I tell that story as a queer tale because uh, we never know who we're sitting next to. We don't know uh, what's going on in people's minds. We don't know about desire in others. Uh, and, um, and we are all so very different. And that I think is a, is a complete and utter blessing. I mean, we are made completely different. Um, I knew when I was very young that I was queer, that I was bisexual. I had crushes on women. Um, the picture on the front of my book is me, you know, back then with dark hair. I always say in my family, we age into blonde. Before I aged into blonde, that was in 1971. Uh, I was next to my girlfriend at the time. The very first Pride, Toronto um, Gay Pride on Hanlon's Point, so a place where gay folk go, and uh, over at the islands. And, um, and so, uh, so kind of, you know, yeah, I came out as a teenager. Um, so that's my story. And, uh, and, it's, and the stories of the Bernices in the world keep me going. So maybe where are we are in time? Just, to, just about at the half hour mark. So maybe I, I'll, I'll kind of rest there and see if there are questions or anything. And trust me, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Ask anything. Say anything. Okay. Thank you, Sherry. And that's a wonderful uh, narrative that you shared with us right now. And as we, before I ask my questions, so, so I see Patrick and Susan. Patrick or Susan, do you have a question? Patrick, do you want to ask a question? Uh, I, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Thank you. I don't want to ask a question, but. I want to say, Sherry, thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you for everything. And uh, uh, thank you for your book. And thank you for all your witness. And thank you for being so strong and so faithful to the vision and for helping to accomplish so much. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very, very much, Sherry. Well, thank you, Patrick. Thank you for, for being you and being there. Thank you. I mean, our church is built from people like you. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that I wouldn't have, uh, the reason I walked into the United Church for the first time in 1988, I wasn't raised in a church, um, was because of 1988, was because that was when General Council decided they would ordain openly gay and lesbian folk. And it was, there were several reasons. There's never just one reason why somebody walks into a church, but that was certainly the predominant one. I would not have gone to a church that didn't that didn't do it, um, and um, and wanted my children to be raised in a church like that. Um, so that that's the other reason I walked into that church when I did. And uh, there being a God and the power of the Holy Spirit, walked into the right one with the right minister at the right time. <laughs> So which, which church was that? Sure. That was Richmond Hill United Church. And at that time, oh. it was Ken Gallinger, who was, uh, oh, who was yeah. in the pulpit, um, who has since re long since retired. Um, but um, yeah, it was a very vibrant community, um, very much suburban, you know, like very suburban. We were living in the suburbs. I, another stage of my life that's also, I, and, you know, recounted in the book was that I went into business um, I mean, I learned business on the streets of Toronto, um, but I went into legitimate business after university and uh, ended up starting my own company and making a lot of money, way, way more money than I've ever made since. Um, and uh, we uh, realized our kind of material dreams at a big house in the suburbs with a swimming pool and a Mercedes in the driveway. So I was that kind of community and they still welcomed, uh, they still welcomed us. So it was... Uh, it was good, yeah. But I mean, I also learned, having made that much money, that that uh, money can be very hollow, you know, and that it doesn't uh, it doesn't provide spiritual nurture. I I would the other reason. Well, there were three reasons. One, 1988, and being accepting of queer folk. Um, the second reason was um, uh, that I discovered, having realized my material dreams, that 
that they weren't really such a dream after all, that I was still worried about my billings every month, that if my billings went down, I wasn't happy, that if they went up, I was happy. And I thought this is no way to live, to be completely dependent on money. Um, and the third reason was my children, because we were driving around Richmond Hill and my son, who was just a little boy at the time, uh, saw this neon cross outside an evangelical church and said, mommy, what's that lighted T for? And I thought, we haven't been doing our parental duty. How are they, how will they ever read Shakespeare? I thought, if we don't, so what, what church can we take them to where they'll learn the stories, but, you know, won't indoctrinate them in, in anything that was toxic. And so, um, again, um, thank you, Richmond Hill United Church. You did that for them as well. So those are the three reasons. So Patrick, I think you had a question. Patrick, did you have another? Oh, no, no, I didn't. So the other question I had, though, was as you were telling uh, your story at the beginning part about being street-involved youth, it reminded me of the two stories I remember reading, or books, uh, as, a, as, a, as a youth myself. One is uh, The Cross and the Switchblade, and sometimes God wears a kid's face. Both are uh, the founding story, one Covenant House, and the other one is Campus Christian, something Crusaders, I can't remember exactly. But I think they're set in New York. But um, no, it reminded me of that, but, but for maybe for from a queer perspective of having a, to me, a transformational moment. Has anyone ever suggested that to you or is that a, a new thought? Sorry, suggested what? Um, that your story was similar to that. Oh, um, no, they have, well, the difference between my story and, and those stories, I think, is that they have a very evangelical, um, yes. and, and by evangelical, um, in my first book, Queering Evangelism, which won the Lambda in 2005, I really question evangelism as yes. it was taught to many of us as being really just another word for sales and marketing, um, which yes. I don't believe was what Jesus lived in evangelism. I always say, you know, Jesus took a church of some 5,000 Sermon on the Mount within three years, whittled it down to a handful of women and died. Um, so clearly evangelism is not about the numbers of people and how you grow a church, but that was the way, um, that's the way it was taught to us, you know, often. Um, and that's what we're all the predominantly, you know, evangelical literature was. So it wasn't about that for me. Um, it was the Holy Spirit looking back in hindsight, you know, was, the, was grace there through every step of my journey? Um, many steps of it, absolutely, yes. But that, but, you know, that kind of, you know, God saved me story. Um, it's not really my story, um, but, but it, you know, not in, in that way. Uh, um, because we know that the flip side, the shadow side of those books that you mentioned were that those, that's that God, that God that they thought they understood did not welcome two SLGBTQ kids that came off the streets, did not welcome them at all. Um, in fact, turn them away. Um, that, that God, um, especially when those books were written, um, did not um, did not accept um, kids for all sorts of reasons. Um, it was very judgmental, and the grace that I felt that that in fact was operative in my life, I think, is a God that, um, if anything, um, was on the side of of the queer kids, was with the marginalized. So my thesis in my thesis, doctoral thesis, and my first book is that evangelism works from the outside in of a church. So we, we sit in church hoping to be evangelized by usually someone that we least expected it from who walks in, sits down next to us, or who we encounter in that midst, who comes from the outside in, usually the margin. So God speaks to us um, through the margins. This is not my thesis alone, but you know, the liberation theology and others talk about the God of the poor, the God of the margins. And that's certainly the God that I've encountered in my life. Um, no evangelical church would have, it, would have welcomed me. Not, not at all, sadly. No, I, I absolutely agree with you on that one, definitely. But I guess think of the power of your story it is almost like a road to Damascus experience in terms of where you were. Now, when you refer to, was it methadone? No, methadine. A me methadrine, methadrine. Methadine. Yeah. So was mm -hmm. that what, what people call crystal meth nowadays? Yeah, it's the same thing. Metamphetamine, okay. methadone. It's been okay. around 
since apparently um, the Second World War, apparently it was kind of an invention that, that uh, went awry uh, to keep troops awake, right? You know, wow. um, um, it, it's still the major, I mean, I just buried a young man this last year during COVID overdosing right. on methadrine. It was, it, it was and is probably still the major drug of choice in the LGBTQ community, but also on the streets generally. Um, that plus heroin and of course fentanyl now. Um, so now we're seeing overdoses from fentanyl, but um, uh, you, you don't see too many overdoses from methadrine, but what you do see, because it's one of the most dangerous drugs to do, is you see people of course just burn themselves out. This destroys yes. your, your body um, in no short order. Um, and so I, I, I still, you know, with younger people that come to our church from the, you know, to us LGBTQ community, I know it's still very much present um, and probably sadly always will be. So, uh, yeah, so that was the scourge back then. And, um, and, and interestingly enough, just sociologically, it was controlled by the bikers back then. And in many communities, it still is, um, you know, different bikers, different era. Um, uh, it's also controlled by the cartels, just like cocaine and, and you know, um, so yes. So uh, now fentanyl is on our streets and that kills you much more quickly and much easier to overdose on. That of course came out of the pharmaceutical industry as well and made its way to the streets. Um, and so we're seeing that in our church, we have a naloxone kit in our office um, just in case. Um, I don't think we've had to use it yet, but that's because COVID shut the church down. Um, uh, but I'm sure that we will have to. I mean, we're, our church is at Bloor near Spadina. We have street folk that live around there. Um, and so probably just a matter of time before somebody walks in and, um, and in a state of overdosing. So I'm very lucky to be alive. Um, I was on a panel last night with uh, three other LGBTQ folk, um, and I'm on a panel for the Parliament of World Religions on Sunday uh, with LGBTQ Folk. And last night, um, I, I, as usual, I'm the oldest person on that panel. <laughs> and I said, um, and they were all concerned to, they're still concerned about living their entire life, you know, I mean, with the, the scourge of AIDS, with, with everything else. Um, I mean, the fact that I'm alive is, I consider a miracle. Uh, and, and so I was, I gave, I, I think I gave them hope just by being alive, and living into being a senior. Um, Never thought I would, and um, and they are still many of them still thinking that they might not. So things change, but some things don't. Right? So well, two things I want to ask was one: what can we do today, uh, locally, perhaps? Because I know we, we raised the issue of crystal meth addiction. Okay. We talked about. Uh, I mean, there, there's talk of perhaps a safe injection site at the Roehampton Shelter in our immediate okay. neighborhood at Manor Road. And uh, that's sort of one response. But what, I mean, because I, I still say that, I think as I observe, when people are, are very closeted about their crystal meth addictions, and it's very hard to talk about those, but so how can we perhaps make it more, uh, and the word is comfortable, but accessible, so people could openly talk about their addictions so that perhaps uh, they can, we can help people into, uh, desiring well whether it be a 12-step program or whatever program they get into so they can, like like yourself you you went from being uh street involved to not being uh, street involved mm -hmm. any any thoughts absolutely um you you do it with help always always yeah. and back then um uh there was really only one shelter i remember well there were two there was scott mission on spadina but that was very older male like it wasn't a place a 16 year old girl was gonna go anywhere near um the other one was was a fred victor mission united church mission by the way um had a church in it back then um had a reverend i remember his name reverend zwicker he's no longer with us um so who helped me i walked into i walked into fred victor um and i met with reverend zwicker he helped me um, and also they had a doctor there. They did their version very, you know, under the, under the table of, you know, safe injection sites. The doctor showed me how to, because methadrine is a, an injectable drug. I learned to inject it. It's more fun that way. Uh, and um, most people do. Um, and, and he showed me how to do it uh, so that I didn't kill myself just injecting myself. He gave me clean um, needles um, and showed me, like walked me through what to do if I was going to do it so that I didn't kill myself just with the injection. 
Um, so, I mean, that kind of help saves lives. So when we talk about safe injection sites, that's what we're talking about, saving lives right there, right then, by, um, by just providing um, clean needles, just, uh, you know, uh, some training, you know, some help, and also um, somebody to talk <clears throat> to. Like, this is so important. Um, it's really important. They also found me a psychiatrist who uh, was able to get me what was then called student welfare. And it gives you a sense of how times have changed, not for the best. Um, so on student welfare, when I got that to get off the streets, I was able to rent a basement apartment and feed myself and go back to college and then university. Um, there's no way you could do that on social assistance now. So livable social assistance rates, and by the way, it was under a conservative government federally, conservative government provincially, and conservative mayor. Um, and what was the difference back then to now? Livable social assistance rates, um, our, our equivalent of what we're asking for now, guaranteed you know, livable income, um, and, and a tax base that would allow governments to, to do that. So, you know, the, when we cut taxes for, for rich people, which we've been doing consistently for decades um, and corporations, um, and then we cut them out of social services, which we've been doing for decades, um, this is what happens. Children die on the streets. People live in tents, in parks. There was none of that in the Toronto I grew up in, and I'm a Torontonian. Um, no, there were no food banks, um, except the two I just mentioned, um, because you could live on welfare. You can't live on welfare anymore. Um, and if you have a disability, you can't live on ODSP anymore. Um, so we basically unethically, I believe, condemn people with disabilities to live in poverty. Um, how did we get here? I mean, that's a good question. I think we should ask our governments like, you know, it used to be better. <laughs> it used to be so much better. Um, so uh, in that regard, and, uh, and I think that's where, you know, just another food bank or just another shelter is not going to cut it. We need no food banks and no shelters. We need people to be able to, everyone to be able to provide for themselves the basics of, uh, basics of life, a, a roof over your head and enough food to eat. That's what we need. And until we get that, um, we can't claim to be uh, uh, anything but an unethical society, I think. So anyway, that's just my political rant for the day. Um, but um, but I'm proof, living proof that it works to um, to allow people to live with some degree of dignity. I mean, I if I was a kid today with the same story, I would be condemned to the streets. I don't know how I would ever get off the streets. Um, certainly not with the ease that I did back then. I would have had to be such a brilliant student, which I wasn't. Um, I would have had to, I don't know, um, how would I have gone to university with the fees as they are now and not ended up with huge debt? And then who would have lent me that money? So, so you see where I'm going with it. And where would I have lived? I wouldn't have been able to afford to live anywhere. I would have had to continue to be involved in the drug trade, um, which probably would have killed me um, or, um, or who knows. So, um, so that's, uh, so thank you to, uh, thank you to many people for, for, for my recovery and for my um, my ability to still be alive. So your question, another question is, uh, you were mentioning about the panel you're on, mm -hmm. about the young people uh, not sure about what's ahead for them. And uh, I guess continuing to be concerned about HIV and AIDS. And so what were some of the issues you were hearing? Because I'd be, I think I'd be quite curious about that. Um, well, um, it, it was a panel, um, I was the only person uh, last night that was not uh, trans, it was at Emanuel College, so do tune into it, it was excellent discussion. Um, so um, you're talking about two of them were American, uh, one, um, you know, a black trans woman um, who talked about, uh, I mean, just the murder rate is ridiculous. Uh, I mean, just the danger of walking out onto the street is you know, a danger. She's from the South. Um, as a high school student, she wasn't allowed to go as herself to her high school prom. This is a story we know in Ontario and everywhere else too. Um, but real concerns, real health concerns. Um, even though Toby's Act passed and um, trans rights is in the Ontario Human Rights Code, it's still not really, um, it's, it's in where healthcare is concerned, it's still really difficult for trans folk to get the surgery and the hormones and the care that they need. Um, sometimes they have to leave the province to get that. 
So um, I think there's a human rights challenge in all of that, but bottom line is that's the case right now. I mean, it's really difficult to get all the care you need. You're on wait lists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it, uh, that care and being on those wait lists puts you at risk. Um, and the stats still show that trans folk are at risk. I mean, we, we until just recently, um, have had a blood ban for gay men in this country. It's taken years and years to lift that. Uh, I mean, there's still many issues um, to be able to get. I have a friend, for example, who, um, who was a very successful broker in Toronto, made a lot of money, um, uh, was HIV positive for many, many years, but it was controlled. Um, and then it got worse as it sometimes happens as people age. Got, he got older, um, developed many health problems, could not work. Well, he could not work for a while, but bottom line is he needed medications so that were many thousands of dollars a month. And as a self-employed person, he could not afford that when the market took a turn. Um, so he was forced to go on ODSP to be able to get his medications for free. Now he's perfectly capable of working, but he wouldn't be able to afford to pay for his drugs if he went back to work. This is ludicrous to me. I mean, this is ludicrous for an economy. It's ludicrous financially. Why are we keeping people on ODSP who could work if we just had, for example, Pharmacare? If his drugs were covered, then he would be able to go back to work. So, um, so there are many stories like this around issues that concern the community that um, mainly and mostly around healthcare issues, but, but others as well. Um, that we still need to address. Uh, and, um, uh, and as somebody said something very wise, uh, and I think it's very true, if the, if, if the place you live is completely safe and supportive of a black trans woman, then it's probably safe and supportive for just about everyone. <laughs> because when you look at the person who's at the lowest, most marginalized, and most under threat in the, in the you know, social totem pole, you're looking at black trans women. Um, and so if we can make the world really safe for them, we can make it safe for just about everybody else. So, you know, the, it's the kind of, you know, raising the watermark so that everybody can float. Um, and I think that's where issues like pharmacare um, come in, where, you know, um, issues of real, you know, coverage for our healthcare services for all people come in. Um, and that keeps people alive. Well, thank you, Sherry. I think any other questions from uh, some of our people? No. Well, thank you again. And it's been very, uh, always interesting and uh, inspiring to sort of see where we can go. And we'll say back to Susan to say, uh, bring uh, a farewell. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah. And I uh, hope you can join us next yeah. week when our speaker will be Paloma Plant, who is with our. Uh, urban bird safety, in other words, safety for migrating birds or just even local birds in cities with all our light pollution. So Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all. Everyone. We'll sign off for now. Have a yeah. great Bye, day. Bye-bye.